Hello Math126 students. I had this idea to make a few short videos on these kind of three separate key concepts uh, in chapter 14.7. So in this one I'm just going to try to talk about local maximin, do one example, show some visuals, try to keep this short, but in case you need a refresher on a couple of the main ideas or if you want to clarify your understanding. Uh, so in a moment I will, I'll say a few things, point out a couple theoretical things that I just talked over briefly in class. But ultimately we defined a critical point as a place where both partial derivatives are zero, where the slope is zero in both directions. And I've been trying to give you a sense about that. And then we defined this weird thing we called the second derivative test, which measured the concavity. And ultimately what I said in class, which is, is D is positive, the concavity does not change. Stays in all directions. So I wanna say a little more about that. I'm gonna show something from the book that I didn't do in class. Uh, and then if D is negative, the concavity changes. And if the concavity changes in some direction, that means it's a saddle point. If the concavity doesn't change, then we need to look at one of these. It doesn't matter which one and see if it's positive or negative. If it's positive, it's concave up. If it's negative, it's concave down, which means it's a min. So that was that first part. So this is one major topic. Um, let's... Uh, I think before I, I will do this example from an old test. This is from my uh, one of my most recent old exams. I'll do it. I'll show some visuals. Before I do that, just a couple things uh, I want to tour here. Uh, so first, there's my re review sheet. Um, if you ever are having trouble, you know, check the discussion board. I have you can click on the homework. You can click on the problem. I have hints and examples. If you're having trouble typing in an answer, you don't want to be banging your head against a wall for that reason. But in terms of the textbook, I want to show a couple things. So there is a proof in the textbook. It talks about directional derivatives. This is why we don't do this in class, because we haven't discussed directional derivatives. Directional derivatives consider the slope in every direction. And I'll show you a quick visual uh, in a moment. But the directional derivative is defined in terms of the partial derivative. So you can get away. So if you have a unit vector that points in some direction, other than straight in the direction of the y-axis or the x-axis. It is possible to get the slope, and it turns out you basically just multiply the components of the vector times the partial derivative values. But that's beside the point. If you take the second derivative of that, so this would be like the concavity in any given direction, you get this long expression. So this is from the very last, they throw this in at the end of section 14.7. Um, but the reason we don't talk about it is because we haven't talked about directional derivatives. But you get this kind of messy expression. Um, and it requires you have the chain. There's several things that go into this. Okay. And then they simplify it and they write it this way. And then someone cleverly completed the square and said, hey, we can rearrange this. And we basically, it, this is one of many ways to rearrange it. But if we do, we have a number times something squared plus something else that's squared times this weird thing which we call d. And it turns out if this is positive and this is positive, then the entire expression is positive, and then you know it's concave up in all directions. Okay, so I, I just wanted to show that. I, in class I never show that because it's just um, messy. If you want, if you're curious about directional derivatives, you can read more, like there's the gradient. There's several interesting things we just don't have time for that, this term. Um, one thing I like about the textbook is it has some visuals. So if you like go to directional derivatives and you're like, I'm just curious about that, you can usually click explore and you can see things. So there's the slope in the X direction. And so let's move it a little bit and look in another direction. There's other slopes. Now we've only talked about the slope in the x direction and the y direction, those two slopes. But you could talk about the slope in the other direction. It's not a big deal to compute those. Okay, so when we're doing the d, we're actually talking about the concavity in any given direction. All right, plenty more to be done. We just are focusing on the slope in the x and the y direction. Okay, let's get to an example. So what does this mean for you? For you, somewhere probably on exam one, you'll be given some multivariable function, and let's just recap what you do. So you compute the partial with respect to x. We want to get really good at this. This needs to be routine for us. 
Um, and apologies, I will, I'll, I'll check my answer at the end just in case if sometimes I make a mistake in the video. Um, rather than re-record or anything, we'll just check my solution at the end and then if there is a correction, we'll do it. But let's do it here. So I need to know when this is zero and this is zero. So at the end of this problem, you're gonna check your work and you're gonna see if your points work. And that's something you do on a test. So this is a very checkable thing to do on a test. You should pick which everyone looks easier to do. So the strategy was factor first. Now everyone I did in class, you could factor in some easy way. This one doesn't look like it, but you should look to factor if possible because that splits it up into smaller, easier to handle cases, uh, which we've been talking about. Okay, so now what? Once you can't factor, then your job is to combine. You should choose whichever equation is easier to solve for one of the variables. And in my opinion, the second one is easier because from the second equation, I can get y equals 3x. And then I'm going to substitute that into the first equation. Okay, so I don't know if this little tree method I'm giving you makes sense, but here's the first equation. just want to say this one more time. And then we're substituting in the following. And this is success. This is the key idea which I'm really kind of my, on my high horse about is which is after you're done, whenever you're solving a system of equations, you should have fewer variables after you combine. If that doesn't happen, you did something wrong. This is going to be 9x uh, plus 6x squared plus 9x equals 0. Uh, so I think that's uh, 6x squared plus 18x. Uh, now I can factor. So I can factor out a 6x and I get an x plus 3 success. There's two possibilities. X could be zero. X could be negative three. And then it's always a question of where do I plug that in? We can always go back to the original. You can plug it in. You can plug it in anywhere along your path that you've been doing. So I would say Y is zero because Y is three X and Y is negative nine. This is really valuable to be able to do this because now I have two points, zero, zero and negative three, negative nine. I know that the only kind of key features of this graph are going to occur there. That's actually pretty valuable. Um, in fact, I always have to do this. If I, In fact, in a moment, I'm going to show you the visuals. And before I could do the visuals, I had to solve this. Because otherwise, I don't know where to search to draw it. And I can't see where the main features are. By doing this, I know, OK, here's where the main features are. OK, let's quickly do the second derivative test. So the partial with respect to x twice is going to be 12x plus 9. The partial with respect to y twice is negative 1. The partial, you have to get used to focusing, but now we're going to do x, then y, so this is going to be 3. And then we're going to do y, then x, that's also going to be 3. This is kind of interesting. This means it's concave down in the y direction no matter what. So I already know before I even start the problem that there's no way this thing can be concave up in all the directions. So there's not going to be any mins. But let's go a little further. Let's compute it. Let's just blindly use the formula. So you compute d at zero, zero. And usually what I do is just compute the three numbers. So D is this times this minus this squared. And again, that comes out of that proof is where that's coming from. This is going to be nine. This is going to be negative one. And this is going to be three. And on a test, I want you to actually calculate this number. Now at this moment, I know the answer. I don't know why I wrote square there. Because the moment that I saw the concavity was different, then I knew it's a saddle point. So then you say saddle point. Uh, the other point when I plug in negative three, negative nine, sorry, I'm not more organized here. Um, so I'm gonna put a negative three in here. So that's gonna be negative 36 plus nine. So I think that's negative 27 and then times negative one and then minus three squared which is 27 minus nine, which is 18. This happens a lot when you just have two critical points, you maybe get the same number, but it's positive. So once that's positive, you have to then look and say, okay, now the concavity doesn't change. And since it's concave down in the X and Y direction, it must be a local max. So this is the key tool for analyzing a given function. So now I know when we go to look at it, I need to look at zero, zero, and negative three, nine. Okay, let's go look at it. Oops, it's still spinning, <laughs> my other graph. Um, let's see, where did I put this? Here it is, okay. 
So I did that, prepared this. So I can tell you that when I first graphed this, I couldn't see anything. Like it was too zoomed in. It looked like this. And I was like, well, this is a terrible example. I can't see anything. And then I did solve the problem and I was like, oh, the problem is I didn't include the point. I need to go far enough out so that I'm including the point negative three, nine and zero, zero. In fact, I probably should go a little further to make it more clear. So sometimes people go, if I have a graphing device, why do I need this? But really, calculus and the graphing device complement each other. hope that kind of makes sense. Um, so the surface itself is here. And now you can see there's a top of a hill right there. And I know where that is. It's when x is negative 3 and y is negative 9. I'll try to turn this so you can see. This is the x-axis now coming towards us and the y-axis going to the right. Uh, and there are two critical places, two critical points, two points where the slope is zero in both directions. Let's go look at them. So let's go look at zero, zero first. So here's zero, zero. If you're at zero, zero, let's zoom in. The slope is zero in both directions. Those are those black lines. I did the slope in the x direction, the slope in the y direction. But you can see that the concavity changed. You can see that it's concave up in some directions and concave down in some other directions. In fact, you can see that the tangent plane crosses the surface. That's a saddle point. That's the classic telltale sign of a saddle point. Now let's go to negative three and negative nine. Okay, let's zoom back out. That's up here on the surface. Those are the only two places where the slope is zero. So even if I zoom further out, I'm not going to find any others, which is really what's valuable about this. It tells you I don't need to keep searching. Um, that's the other place, and that happens to be a max. All right, hope that helps. Just wanted to do a recap there.